Chapter 2 Blacktop to concrete, concrete to grass, alongside the house that lay across the street from Mrs. Sanchez's place, through the rear yard to a wrought iron fence and over, then across a narrow alleyway, up a slump stone wall, Harlow Landerson ran and clambered and flung himself. I wondered where he might be going. He couldn't outrun either me or Justice, and he certainly couldn't outrun who he was. Beyond the slump stone wall lay a backyard, a swimming pool, dappled with morning light and tree shadows. A water, the water glimmered in shades of blue from sapphire to turquoise, as might a trove of jewels left by long-dead pirates who had sailed a sea since vanished. On the farther side of the pool, behind a sliding glass door, a young woman stood in pajamas, holding a mug of whatever brew gave her the courage to face the day. When he spotted the startled observer, Harlow changed directions towards her. Maybe he thought he needed a shield, a hostage, whatever he was looking for wasn't coffee. I closed on him, snared his shirt, hooked him off his feet. The two of us plunged deep into the end of the pool. Having banked a summer's worth of desert heat, the water wasn't cold. Thousands of bubbles like shimmering showers of silver coins flipped across my eyes, rang against my ears. Thrashing, we touched bottom, and on the way back up, he kicked, he flailed. With elbow or knee or foot, he struck my throat. Although the impeding water robbed the blow of most of its force, I gasped, swallowed, choked on the taste of chlorine flavored with tanning oil. Losing my grip on Harlow, I tumbled in slow-mo through the undulant curtains of green light, blue shadow, and broke the surface, surface into spangles of sunshine. I was in the middle of the pool. Harlow was at the edge. He grabbed the coping and jacked himself. Don't copy. He jacked himself into the concrete deck. Coughing, venting atomized water from both nostrils, I splashed noisily after him. As a swimmer, I have less potential for Olympic competition than for drowning. On a particularly dispiriting night, when I was 16, I found myself chained to a pair of dead men and dumped off a boat in Malo Suente Lake. Ever since then, I've had an aversion to aquatic sports. That man-made lake lies beyond the city limits of Pico Mundo. Malo Suerte means bad luck. Constructed during the Great Depression as a project of Works Progress administration. The lake originally had been named after an obscure politician. Although they had thousands of stories about its treacherous waters, nobody around these parts can quite pin down when or why the place was officially renamed Malo Suerte. All records relating to the lake burned in the courthouse fire of 1954 when a man named Mel Gibson protested the seizure of his property for non-payment of taxes. Mr. Gibson's protest took the form of self-immolation. He wasn't related to the Australian actor with the same name who would decades later become a movie star. Indeed, by all reports, he was neither talented nor physically attractive. Now, because I haven't burdened on this occasion by a pair of men too dead to swim for themselves, I reached the edge of the pool in a few swift strokes. I levered myself out of the water. Having arrived at the sliding door, Hollow Landerson found it locked. The pajamaed woman had disappeared. As I scrambled to my feet and started to move, Harlow backed away from the door far enough to get momentum. Then he ran at it, leading with his left shoulder, his head tucked down. I winced in expectation of gouting blood, severed limbs, a head guillotined by a blade of glass. Of course, the safety pane shattered into cascades of tiny gummy pieces. Harlow crashed into the house with all his limbs intact and his head still attached to his neck. Glass crunched and clinked under my shoes when I entered in his wake. I smelled something burning. We were in a family room. All the furniture was oriented towards a big screen TV as large as the pair of refrigerators. The gigantic head of the female host on the Today Show was terrifying in such magnified detail. In these dimensions, her perky smile had the warmth of a barracuda's grin. Her twinkly eyes... Here the size of lemons seemed to glitter maniacally. 
In this open floor plan, the family room flowed into the kitchen with only a breakfast bar intervening. The woman had chosen to make a stand in the kitchen. She gripped a telephone in one hand and a butcher knife in the other. Harlow stood at the threshold between rooms trying to decide if a twenty-something housewife in two cute sailor suit pajamas would really have the nerve to gut him alive. She brandished a knife and she shouted into the phone, He's inside! He's right here! Past her, on a far, far counter, smoke poured from a toaster. Some kind of pop-tart, pop-up pastry had failed to pop. It smelled like strawberries and smoldering rubber. The lady was having a bad morning. Harlow threw a bar stool at me and ran out into the family room towards the front of the house. Ducking the stool, I said, Ma'am, I'm sorry about the mess, and I look, went looking for Penny's killer. Behind me, the woman screamed, Stevie, lock your door! Stevie, lock your door! By the time I reached the foot of the open stairs and in the foyer, Harlow had climbed, climbed to the landing. I saw why he had been drawn upward instead of fleeing the house. At the second floor stood a wide-eyed little boy about five years old wearing only undershorts. Holding a blue teddy bear by one of its feet, the kid looked as vulnerable as a puppy stranded in the middle of a busy freeway. Prime hostage material. Stevie, lock your door! Dropping the blue bear, the kid bolted for his room. Harlow charged up the second flight of stairs. Sneezing out the tickle of chlorine and the tang of burning strawberry jam dripping squishing, I ascended with somewhat less heroic flair than John Wayne and Sands of Iwo Jima. I was more scared than my quarry because I had felt I had something to lose, not at least of all Stormy Llewellyn and our future together that the fortune-telling machine had seemed to promise. If I encountered a husband with a handgun, he'd shoot me unhesitatingly as he would Harlow. Overhead, a door slammed hard. Stevie had done as his mother had instructed. If he had a pot of boiling lead in the tradition of Quasimodo, Harlow Landerson would have poured it on me. Instead came a sideboard that evidently had stood on the second floor hall opposite the head of the stairs. Surprised to discover that I had the agility and balance of a monkey, albeit a wet monkey, I scrambled off the stairs onto the railing. The deadfall rocked past step by step, drawers gaping open and snapping shut repeatedly as if the furniture were possessed by the spirit of a crocodile. On the railing, up the stairs, I reached the second floor hall as Harlow began to break down the kid's bedroom door. Aware that I was coming, he kicked harder. Wood splintered with a dry crack and the door flew inward. Harlow flew with it as he'd been sucked out of the hall by an energy vortex. Rushed across the rushing across the threshold, pushing aside the rebounding door, I saw the boy trying to wriggle under the bed. Harlow had seized him by the left foot. I snatched a smiling panda bear lamp off the red nightstand and smashed it over Harlow's head. A ceramic carnage of perky black ears fractured the white face, black paws, and chunks of white belly exploded across the room. In a world where biological systems and the laws of physics functioned with the absolute dependability that science, scientists claimed for them, Harlow would have dropped stone-cold unconscious as surely as the lamp shattered. Unfortunately, this isn't such a world. As love empowers some frantic mothers to find the superhuman strength to lift overturned cars to free their trapped children, so depravity gave Harlow the will to endure a panda pounding without significant effect. He let go of Stevie and rounded on me. Although his eyes lacked elliptical pupils, he reminded me of the eyes of a snake keen with venomous intent, and though his bared teeth included no hooked or dramatically elongated canines, the rage of a rabid jackal gleamed in his silent snarl. This wasn't the person whom I'd known in high school so few years ago, not the shy kid who found magic and meaning in the patient restoration of a Pontiac Firebird. Here 
was a diseased and twisted bramble of a soul thorny and cantankerous, which perhaps until recently had been imprisoned in a deep turning of Harlow's mental labyrinth. It had broken down the bars of its cell and climbed up through the castle keep, deposing the man who had been Harlow, and now it ruled. Released, Stevie squirmed all the way under his bed, but no bed offered shelter to me, and I had no blanket to pull over my head. I can't pretend that I remember the next minute with clarity. We struck at each other when we saw an opening. We grabbed at anything that might serve as a weapon, swung it, flung it, a flurry, a flurry of blows, staggered both of us into a, a clinch, and I felt his hot breath on my face, a spray of spittle. I heard his teeth snapping, snapping at my right ear, as panic pressed upon him the tactics of a beast. I broke the clinch, shoved him away with an elbow under the chin and a knee that missed the crotch for which it was intended. Sirens arose in the distance, just as Stevie's mom appeared in the open door, butcher knife glinting and ready. Two cavaliers, one in pajama, the other one in blue and black uniform of the Pico Mundo Police Department. Hold on. Here we go. Harlow couldn't get past both me and the armed woman. He couldn't reach Stevie, his longed-for shield under the bed. If he threw open a window and climbed onto the front porch roof, he would be fleeing directly into the arms of the arriving cops. As the sirens swelled louder, nearer, Harlow backed into a corner where he stood gasping, shuddering, wringing his hands, his face gray with anguish. He looked at the floor, the walls, the ceiling, not in the manner of a trapped man assessing the dimensions of his cage, but with the bewilderment, as though he could not recall how he would got how he'd come to be in this place and predicament. Unlike the beasts of the wild, the many cruel verities of human monsters, when at last cornered, seldom fight with greater ferocity. Instead, they revealed the cowardice at the core of their brutality. Harlow's wringing hands twisted free of each other and covered his face. Through the chinks in the ten-fingered armor, I could see his eyes twitching with bright terror. Backed into the jammed corner, he slid down the junction of walls and sat on the floor with his legs splayed in front of him, hiding behind his hands as though they were a mask of invisibility that would allow him to escape the attention of justice. The sirens reached a peak of volume half a block away, then subsided from squeal to growl the waning groan in front of the house. The day had dawned less than an hour ago, and I had spent every minute of the morning living up to my name.